Peter Schweitzer and Eric Eggers, we're filling in on the Sean Hannity Radio Show. We want you to join the conversation, 1-800-941-7326. We have the Drill Down podcast, and we were talking earlier about inflation and food prices. Uh, but, Eric, we don't need to worry because they had a meeting in Dubai uh, with 70,000 people showing up, uh, and they're going to solve this problem. Yeah, the from the people that told you you could no longer buy a fossil fuel powered vehicle come the people that will tell you how to grow which food you're allowed to eat and when you're allowed to eat it. Uh, the headline coming from COP, the Council of Parties, this is the 28th version of this collection of global do-gooders. They have now told us that uh, food is on the table. And that should absolutely <laughs> terrify everybody. Yeah, and what it means, by the way, is they are seeking a dramatic reduction in the amount of meat that is produced, primarily beef, because they say it's not good for the environment. Uh, what that means is it's going to get a lot more expensive. Now, the elites that fly to Dubai on their private planes for this conference, they'll be able to still afford it. You know, they're going to get that nice big roast. Uh, the rest of us, it's going to get really expensive to do it. And I think there's a certain irony, by the way, that this event being held in an oil-producing country uh, didn't really focus as much on dealing with fossil fuels, which presumably you would think they'd want to. Instead, they go the direction of agriculture, and small countries like Vanuatu are looking for a big payday. Yeah, lots of big takeaways from this thing. For the first time, they agreed to create this fund by which the what they call the polluting countries. Countries, aka the big wealthy countries, will now give money to the poor countries. So mm -hmm. countries like you know the Marshall Islands, like we didn't come here to sign our death warrant, but we will pick up a check. <laughs> and that's essentially what the John cares. That was like, oh, you're very brave for being here. Please take this check with our sincere apologies. But that's literally what they're doing. And so I think those are the things that are on the table. Not the least of which is going to be, hey. Uh, if 30% or of a third of the greenhouse gas emissions come from the way we grow food, that's one of the headlines in the news, then guess what's next in terms of the things they're trying to control about your life. So coming up after the break, we're going to talk to our fantastic colleague, Seamus Bruner. He's at the Government Accountability Institute. Also, how many amazing researchers do we have and authors in our stable? Too many. But Seamus' book, Control Agarks, is blowing up the Internet. It actually created a new word. The word of the year in Australia is control agarch. And so he's the one that broke the story about Bill Gates and his um, how much farmland he's buying and how he's got the, uh, the patents on these seeds. So if you're wondering who's in charge of telling you which food and where you're allowed to grow it, uh, Bill Gates is the moment and he can explain on this other news. Yeah, so we're going to look forward to Seamus talking about that. We're very proud of him. He started with us as an intern 10 years ago, and he's now written several uh, books. So stay with us. We'll be back shortly. And again, join the conversation, 1-800-941-SEAN. We'll be back after this. Exposing left-wing media bias. No stone left unturned. The Sean Hannity Show is back on the air. Hi, this is Peter Schweitzer, and sitting next to me, Eric Eggers, and we are filling in for Sean as he takes a well-deserved break. I'm the president of the Government Accountability Institute. Eric's the vice president there. I'm a number one New York Times bestselling author, and we do a podcast together called The Drill Down. Please do check it out. We talk about cronyism, corruption, and the abuse of power, and how to fight back. You know, it isn't often someone says, I am a number one New York Times bestselling author, and yet still manages to undersell themselves. But you've managed to perform <laughs> Just that feat, Peter Schweitzer. Uh, Peter Schweitzer, of course, is the person who wrote the book Clinton Cash, who exposed the overlap of interests into donations to the Clinton Foundation and the people that got favors from Hillary when she was Secretary of State. Our research and reporting on Hunter Biden has continued to set the stage for the revelations that you're now seeing being investigated at the steps of Capitol Hill, which is actually very encouraging and very exciting, and I think a credit to the work that uh, you do. And one of the people who has read Every email that Hunter Biden has received and has advanced the reporting on the Hunter Biden story as much as anybody is our colleague Seamus Bruner, who has another book, surprisingly this one, not about Hunter Biden, but about actually something far more serious and nefarious. The book is called Control Legarchs. Seamus works with us at the Government Accountability Institute. Seamus, um, we were just talking about the Council of Parties and this collection of global do-gooders and the way in which they want to control our lives in the name of global improvement. What's the most concerning thing to come out of COP for you? 
Yeah, well, I think, as you mentioned before the break, in order to, quote, save the planet, these guys are very ambitious. Uh, and I call them the control oligarchs. These are the people at COP28 setting the policy. In order to save the planet, they want to reduce your meat consumption and basically take full control over the food supply. And so they're doing this in a number of ways. I mean, number one, outright bans. They're doing bans on certain agricultural activities, fertilizers, even cows. Like right now, Ireland is preparing to slaughter tens, perhaps hundreds of thousands of cows on the altar of climate change. Wait, pause. So you're telling me people are going to kill cows in the name of climate change? Yeah, up to 200,000. Because, because, cl- because cows are big polluters. It's going to cost a lot of money, too, by the way, to kill these cows. Here's the question everyone in America that's listening to you right now wants to know. If they go get an impossible Whopper from Burger King, are they a communist? <laughs> <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> oh, I want to know, too, when they kill all these cows, are we going to get to eat them, or are they just going to discard them? Unclear, but, <laughs> but it sounds like a lot of ribeyes are going to go to waste. Um, so this, and the banning method, you know, this is, this is the first way that they want to change your behavior, change what you can eat. Uh, the banning method is resulting in major backlash. I mean, you've seen the Dutch farmers erupting in protest, uh, fa- you know, farm yeah. tractor convoys in Canada. But that was and, about C. Seeds, though, right? The- and, no, that's about the fertilizer restriction. Okay. So it's not just cows. They want to ban certain types of fertilizer. Right now, uh, France, f- French farmers are also erupting in protest. They've been dumping and spraying cow maneuver over government buildings. This just happened in the last two weeks. French farmers are dumping cow manure over buildings in France because of, like, this is the, the restrictions, rich. the climate change restrictions coming out of things like COP28. And just um, to be clear, this is not a new form of French art. This is a protest. <laughs> no. Okay. No, is it's it me a smelly just- form of protest. This French manure just seems a little classy than anybody else. <laughs> it? It? it does, right? <laughs> it it's like I'm mad, is. but I'm not that mad because it might be a delicacy in New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, the, so the banning method, I mean, that's really uh, ticking off the farmers. But here's really the more pernicious method, uh, and it's how they nudge behaviors. And they're artificially raising the costs of the inputs for farmers until you'll eventually find that you can't afford the delicious ribeye steaks at the grocery store. And you'll find that the lab-grown protein protein cells, these fake meats that people like Bill Gates are invested in, are just cheaper than ground beef. And so you'll think, well, it doesn't taste that different. And so you'll find that your behavior has changed uh, without even knowing it. And, and this is the wildest part of your book, by the way. When you get into the Bill Gates stuff, you have a phrase that you use for this. Like, Bill Gates has a phrase that he uses to try to, like, incentivize people to do things that you might not otherwise. Like, if you think about the idea, hey, would you like to eat something that's not really meat? No. But... <laughs> But Bill Gates has a way to try to make you do that. Yeah, well, I mean, he calls it alternative proteins, which sounds much nicer than fake lab-grown uh, meats. But he also has this term, a nifty little euphemism, for the price increases that we're experiencing. He calls them green premiums. Mm. And so he knows that we don't want to eat fake meat, and we will balk at the price of uh, various green technologies. I mean, for, he also talks about green premiums on electric vehicles. Um, but it's a way to make your preferred meat or your preferred vehicle more expensive, raising the cost of fuel, um, raising the cost of the types of fertilizers or, or grow, you know, having cows. And so that will, and then in turn, subsidize the alternatives that he wants. And so uh, he's plowed $11.6 billion into his food takeover scheme. And uh, actually, Pete Buttigieg, some, some listeners re- may remember, said the quiet part out loud kind of about these green premiums. He says, quote, the more pain we are all experiencing from the high price of gas, the more benefit there is for those who can access o- electric vehicles. Uh-huh. And so that's really the way they see this is the more pain that you experience when buying steaks at the store, the more benefit there is to companies like Impossible Meats. Well, and here's the part, honestly, I have to say that's genius about what Bill Gates is doing. I think it's a terrible idea. I think there's so much hyping of of the the, the climate change issue. But explain to people, this is actually a scheme not just to, quote-unquote, save the planet, but for Bill Gates to actually make money because he wants to replace real beef, which is not patented, with fake meat that he and his buddies have the patents for. So he's going to make money when we make this transition from pure natural beef to this lab meat that he's making. Like, it's funny. You would say, oh, you've cornered the market on fake meat. It sounds like a put down you'd use against your buddy in college, but it's actually <laughs> Bill Gates' business strategy. It's exactly right. And he's doing it. And he and the other controller garks are doing it across a variety of industries, not just food. And so I get into the book, like the number one goal of the controller garks, besides making money, is to take power away from 
and this would be organizations like you know in the you know COP28 or the United Nations. The number one goal they have is to take power away from countries and citizens, Americans like you and me, and transfer that power to international institutions that they control. And so once you understand that that's their goal, and, and so it's the Food and Agriculture Organization is who COP28 uh, put out as like the, they've got the roadmap to the fake meat future. Once you understand that the goal is to take power away from countries and transfer it to international institutions they control, a lot of the chaos starts to make sense. I mean, you touched on inflation and open borders, uh, crime, homelessness. I mean, it, it feels like, uh, you know, these can't be just accidents all happening at once. And there's a concerted effort in a lot of the crises that we see to to take power away from countries and give it to organizations that are going to solve these crises. Well, and here's the thing. Seamus backs all of this up, not with opinion, not with somebody else's opinion, but with hard facts. He's gone through the corporate records. He's gone through the the, the, the histories. His book is Control Oligarchs, the subtitle Exposing the Billionaire Class, Their Secret Deals, and the Globalist Plot to Dominate Your Life. I would highly recommend you pick it up. This is one of the defining issues we are going to face And the problem is, it depends, you know, certainly who is in political office, but these guys want to implement their agenda regardless of who is president. So unless you have a presidential candidate and elected officials that are willing to resist them, this is the path that seems to be going forward for Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, and, and of course, George Soros, who are featured on the cover of your book. And here's my concern, is if they get buy-in at the federal level to support these crazy policies... Because there's a lot of ag lobbyists at COP, right? I mean, just like there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of fossil fuel lobbyists at this collection as well. They said there's 2,400 fossil fuel lobbyists because they recognize that there actually might be policies that dramatically negatively impact the industry. But you've also now seen some of these oil and gas companies start to get into things like carbon capture, right? So you're you're moving away from doing the things that made them very successful businesses. There's a lot of ag lobbyists at COP. Do we actually think if the money's there that the ag companies start moving away from? Things like traditional agriculture and moving more towards these things when they become part of the solution, quote unquote, because it makes them money if they're going to actively disincentivize the thing they've done before. I mean, yeah, that's exactly right. It's, and it's it's uh, the big, powerful farm companies. It's not your average, you know, Joe Farmer, uh, you know, down the road. It's it's big Monsanto-like, Cargill-like, you know, multinational corporations and their lobbyists who are taking control of the agriculture industry and putting the smallholder farmers out of business. And so just ask any farmer you may know if their business has gotten more or less profitable since climate change became public enemy number one. It's gotten less profitable. Farmer... You know, generation owned farms are going out of business, you know, left and right, and they're getting bought up. And that's why Bill Gates is buying all this farmland is he's making it compliant with the new regulations that are coming out of events like COP28. Uh, and so he's got the solution uh, to your problems. You didn't know you had problems, but Bill Gates has got the solutions. <laughs> Which is why French farmers are flinging feces all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Well, and this, this highlights a truism that we have found at GAI over and over again uh, uh, occurs in American politics. The biggest lie is that big government hates big business. Big government loves big business. They would rather deal with a couple of large, powerful ag firms than deal with 100,000 medium-sized farmers because it's a lot more complicated. And by the way, if you work for the government, if you work at the ag department, you may want to go work for one of these companies. You may want to go work for Bill Gates. You're going to make a lot more money doing that than trying to become a, a, a farmer yourself. So this is a reinforcing cycle within big government and big business. They're not enemies. They're actually allies. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, competition is Bill Gates's number one enemy. I mean, that's why Microsoft got into trouble in the 90s for trying to put the competition out of business. And that's actually a central theme of the book is uh, the control oligarchs want a control oligopoly. They want to control every industry with very few p- players where they're sort of competitors. But it's it's much more like what they have in China with these state run businesses that are, there's only a handful of players. They're all in bed with the government. And uh, that's the ideal system to the people going to events like COP28. It's such a great point. I hate to I hate to give you credit on national radio because you always take my parking spot, but also because, <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's an excellent point. Uh, Bill Gates has an anti-competitive track record <laughs> that was litigated at the highest levels of the U.S. court system. So we know that this is a business model. And as Peter Schweitzer has reported in his last number one New York Times bestselling book, Red Handed, all these big tech guys, many of whom you have as control oligarchs, love what? The Chinese Communist Party. They love China. Bill Gates loved China. Tell us about Bill Gates' 
Gates' relationship and what he admires about the dictatorial regime in Beijing. Yeah, well, Bill Gates, Klaus Schwab, a lot of the other characters in this book, they praise China. They love China because China is, and they use, again, euphemisms, and they say things like, efficient or their ability to mobilize resources. What that really means is they're a tyrannical state with total authoritarian control over their populace and they can move without any sort of pesky voting or elections and things like that. They can just uh, take over, you know, whatever they want. And that's what they that's what they love most about China. It's my biggest complaint about free speech and human rights. It's so inefficient. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Who has time to build these into the business model? Seamus Bruner, amazing work. This really is a great book. And uh, I teased it before the break, but control oligarch is a word you made up for your book, but it was also named the new word of the year in Australia. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I was shocked. I was just searching to see if anybody had, you know, picked up some coverage. And all of a sudden, I look at Sky News Australia, and they have uh, their resident wordsmith. I'll give him a shout out, Kel Richards. He's the man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he ran a study and had, you know, took votes and things like misinformation and like other terms popped up. But uh, control oligarchs was the number one new word in Australia. Was Congratulations, the number one new word in Australia, and it should be the number one book in the country. It's that important, and it, I think it's absolutely laying out a roadmap for what people are trying to do to our lives in America, and that's why we continue to highlight the reporting that's done there. Uh, We'll talk more about that. Take your calls when we come back. It's 1-800-941-7326. That's 1-800-941-SEAN. It's Peter Schweitzer and Eric Eggers, host of the Drill Down Podcast, in for Sean Hannity. Back right after this.